And so for you to manifest, you have to build up, build up in prayer. Because there is a place you pray to where there are coals of fire. That's where your tongue will be touched. And if your tongue is taught, it will be taught. When you come back, you can become a prophet. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. And be seated. God bless you. This morning, I'd like us to look at God's word very quickly. By the way, how many of you were blessed last night? Wow, glory to God. Praise God. See, the word of God is the word of life. Um, it's very potent. And it has the capacity to transform you. The Bible said he holds all things by the word of his power. Everything is gathered together in creation by the word of his power. That's why you must make it a habit to become a student of the word. In Isaiah 34 verse 16 the Bible says, Search ye out of the book of the Lord and read it. He said, Not one of it shall fail. He said, not one shall desire his mate. He said, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it, and his spirit has gathered it. Such, ye out of the book of the Lord. It has the power to gather your life and make meaning out of it. Every challenge you have in life, the solution is trapped in the world. If you get the word, you've gotten everything you would ever need in life. So when the word of the Lord is brought forth, pay rapt attention so that your spirit can be focused to receive. It is when the word gets into your spirit that it makes a difference in your life. You may have it in your head. If it is not in your spirit, it will not change you. It will not transform you. And it will not edify you. When you have crisis, they collide with your mind. Everything you have in your mind will vanish. It is what you have in your spirit that will come forth. So when the word of the Lord is brought forth, pay rapt attention. Are we together? Praise the Lord. You know, last night we began to establish what the kingdom of God was all about. And I told you it is the governing influence of a king over a people and a territory producing a citizenry of people that expresses the will and the purpose of the king as a way of life. And we try to look at the structure of the kingdom. And I told you the kingdom has a king. There are thrones. There are dominions and there are court sessions. There are courts in the kingdom to advance the laws of God. So the kingdom is very legalistic. In order to show you some examples, I had to talk to you about the life of Cain. You know, Cain had become familiar with God. God speaks and then they, they speak back carelessly. You know how it feels like when you are tired and the Holy Ghost wants you to pray, and you say, I love you, Lord, and you just go back to sleep, you become used to the voice of God. You say, go there and talk to that brother. The brother is eating now. Maybe some other times, you know. You become used to the voice of God. Cain was like that. But he didn't know that the one that was talking to him at that time was not Elohim that he knows. It was not Jehovah that he knows. The one that was talking was a judge. The king came. Where is thy brother? Can you imagine how familiar somebody has become with the voice of God and you tell God, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> is that God you are talking to? 
the guy had become familiar. Am I my brother's keeper? Ah! How I wish he understood better. The next thing he heard was that the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. The syllables have changed. And he said, you shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the face of the earth. The God he knew was no longer the one speaking. The one speaking now is bringing verdict on account of the justice system of heaven. And Cain did not have understanding. You know, the same thing happened in the book of Daniel. Bethesda, who was the king at the time, was having so much fun. So much fun that he decided to take off the chalices in the, in the temple to drink wine with. These were hallowed materials. They were sacred, separated unto God. But because he, he was having fun, he ran out of wisdom. So he took off the cups of the items and the utensils from the temple to have fun. And suddenly a hand appeared on the wall and began to write. The moment he saw it, he knew another dimension had superimposed on his own dimension. The Bible said he was fidgeting and his knees were clogged to themselves. Instantly problem had come. He gathered all his wise men to interpret the writing on the word. There was no one in the realm with that level of understanding. Until Daniel was recommended. The person that recommended Daniel said, He said, in the days of your father, there is one that dwells in this land. He said, in him is the spirit of excellent wisdom. He said, light and excellent wisdom dwelt in this Daniel. He said what? Light and excellent wisdom dwelt in this Daniel. He said, in him is the spirit of the holy gods. He said he has capacity to discern wisdom and to explain hard sentences. He said, call for him. And when Daniel came, Daniel began to speak on behalf of the court session that was in heaven. He began to interpret the laws. Because this man does not understand that the earth realm is governed by a higher dimension. There is a law, a legal system that was in the spirit that navigated that controlled and regulated the affairs of the sons of men. So he told him how God had blessed him. How God had exalted him. But he took the errors of his fathers. His father had the same, committed the same blunder. And for seven years he was cast into the wilderness, giving the heart of a beast to live among the beasts for seven years. Until God exalted him again when his heart was humbled. And he said after that God decided to bless him. And he decided to Praise the God of Ion. These were his sacrileges. Praising and exalting the God of Ion, the God of stone, the God of silver, that have no life, instead of the God that had exalted him. And he took of the holy utensils from the temple. He said, because of this, this handwriting has come. And this is what he said. Mene, mene, teke ufasin. He said, mene means you have been gathered. Teke, you have been weighed on the balances and you have been found wanting. And ufasin means... Tonight, your kingdom will be divided among the medics and the patients. That night, the kingdom was taken and he was slain. That is because even though you are not aware, there is a government operating in a realm. That government is the one responsible for the activities that play around your life. What the wisdom of scripture does is that it opens your eyes to the operations of that government so that you will align with them. Are we together? You need to align with that government because the powers that manages the operations of that government is superior to the powers of your realm. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 it said, He upholds all things by the word of His power. The moment that government is exonerated from your government, your own government will collapse. So the reason we are trying to look into these matters is to help you know how to align with the sequence that comes from that realm. Many have faulted and they have suffered. You know, when Paul was persecuting the church and Jesus spoke from heaven, he said, So, so, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus Christ, whom thou persecutest. And he made a statement. He said, It is hard. 
to kick against the bricks. The word is barbed wire. It is hard to kick against the barbed wire. Do you know what he was telling him? The things that you are seeing, they have been ordained in eternity. They didn't begin here. That you are seeing them happening now does not mean their foundation is now. Those things were already wired. They were configured into the atrium before time began. There is a government that monitors their operation. If you are wise, line up with them and you become relevant. It is hard to kick against the barbed wire. For Saul was wise. And instantly he made a U-turn. And his life took a new meaning. There is a government in the spirit realm. The beauty of it is that we have been called to be representatives of that government. Why did I go through the route to show you the authority of that government? So that you will be confident in your representation. In a bid to represent that government, you may stumble upon a man with a gun. Now, if you don't understand the authority of that government, your heart will palpitate and you will faint. But if you have understanding of the authority schemes and sequences of the government that you represent, even if you walk through the waters, you will know you will not be born. Even if you go through the sea, you will know you will not be drowned. That's why we are going through the route to explain to you the operations of that government. And just in case, just in case you die in the process, the authority of that government transcends time and space. That you died functioning for that government gives you relevance in the world to come. Because that government has an immortal power. You know, the Bible said in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, from verse 32, he said, Time will fail me to speak of Gideon, to speak of Barak, to speak of Jephthah, Samson, David, Samuel, and the prophet. He said, Who through faith subdued kingdom, obtained righteousness, Rot, he said, they rattled the foundations of nations. They quenched the violence of fire. They shut the mouth of lions. They put to flight the armies of the aliens. He didn't stop there. He said, some were divided asunder. They tore them apart. Because they were representing what? This government that we speak about. They were what? Sown asunder. He says some, in the face of deliverance, they rejected it so that they may have a better resurrection. These ones were about to be killed and they said, no, don't kill us. We want to die for the government. And the Bible said, for those ones, he said, the world is not worthy of their name. So, if you have this understanding, you will know the scope of service that is required of you. It is a service that transcends life. And there is no losing in it. Even if you die, you have not lost. Because you are translated into a higher dimension. Your service has an eternal scope. It has an immortal scope. But you need to understand the operations of this government. So the essence of this teaching is to show you what you need to do in order to become completely yielded to the government. The kingdom of God is a legalistic kingdom. It comes to demand your life. And if you can as much as yield your life to that kingdom, you will become relevant not just in this life, but in the life to come. The problem we have in the church is the lack of yieldedness to the government of God. It seizes you, brings you in, and empowers you to represent it. So in the sequence of Paul's writing, he introduced himself as an apostle, a preacher and a teacher. He went further and introduced himself as a, a servant. He now went further and introduced himself as a prisoner. He began to understand that the more he went into the system, the more he lose his will. His will was taken away so that something else can be manifested. And the more he did that, the more he became mighty with God. The journey today is a journey from self onto selflessness so that God can be revealed through you. The essence of the government and its influence is to take you away so that you can become a theater through which Jesus and his kingdom can be manifested. The purpose of the journey of the conference is to make every one of us who is a legal representative of that government to become a manifest representation of that government. Because you could be a legal representative 
and you will not be a manifest representative. There is what you need to do in order to become a manifest representative of that government. Because that government has protocols, it has laws, it has sequences and ordinances. You must know how to align with them so that you can represent it. You see, there are a lot of Christians that have made up their mind to serve the Lord. They are even willing to die for God, but they don't know how to manifest Him. Because some of us have been wrapped in a web of activity. Where we gave our hearts to Christ, it was all about activity. So we followed the patterns of activity, but there was no manifestation of God. Tonight, I'm going to show you two things, two ingredients of the kingdom that invigorates and manifests the life of God through you. The first one is called life. The second one is called the spirit. If your reference does not begin from life and the spirit, even if you choose to die for the kingdom, you can never manifest it. Uh, this realm that we have come into now is not a realm that manifests through laws again. The rules have become our culture. We are now empowered to manifest it naturally. Just the way you woke up this morning because you are a human being. Now, the reason you woke up and you walked, took your bath, dressed up and sat here is because there is a life operating in your body. It's called the animal life. Now, you don't need rules to do that. It is now a natural sequence with you because of the operations of that life. There is also a soulish life that operates in your mind. That life, is, it regulates your choices. It regulates your inferences. And then there is a spirit life. That one is inside the inner man. You must know how to draw the spirit life to dominate the soulish life and the animal life. In the, book, in, the, in the New Testament, they are differentiated in Greek words. The body life is called bios. The soulish life is called switch. And the spirit life is called zoe. The life I'm talking about is zoe. You need to know that our calling into Christ is a calling unto zoe. It's not a calling unto activity. Activities are important because through them, we administer the purposes of God. But before we engage activity, we must know how to empower and maximize the way. A lot don't know it. Let me show you some scriptures. So that you know how the New Testament preach Christians were thinking. They don't think the way we think. We, we think born again is church service. Born again is counseling, is ushering. That's how we begin to think. So immediately somebody is born again, we fire them into this unit, fire them into that unit, and then they begin to work. And because we see that they are working passionately, after three months we make them a leader. That's not how the New Testament church operated. To them, coming into Christ first is apprehension of life. You master the operation of that life. It is when that life begins to break out that you break out with it. You don't break out before life comes. So we have people who preach. It's why they are preaching that they are going to learn how to study the Bible. But when the sequence of life is activated in you, it creates a hunger for the word of God. So you find yourself reading the Bible so much so that anybody you want to talk to, you talk Bible. That's how they became preachers. They didn't become preachers because they went to a theology school and learned the Bible to teach. They became preachers because the word broke out of them. They understood how life operated. So that life breaks out. Now, they didn't become prophets because they, they, they were learning how to open the third eye. They became prophets because they, they dwelt in the spiritual realm until things began to break out of them. So suddenly, they see people, they discover they know some things. These things were operations of life. That's how they entered into things. They entered into things by life. So no matter how long they run, they never get tired. They don't go to church because they say come. They go to church because there's a hunger to dwell with the brethren. So they look for where the brethren are. Even when they were looking for them to kill them, they go to the caves to meet. And when they are in church, they don't get tired. Services that time could last for eight hours. Hope you read the story of Ananias. They were in church. He came and lied and died. It was three hours later the wife came. They were still in church. So it was hunger that was driving them because life was working. Life was operating. You need to know that the core is unto life and then learn how to maximize life. That's where the journey begins from. But the problem with us is that we are called into activity. We are not called into life. So we have Christians doing all kinds of things in church. The guy you see operating on the keyboard, if you see him in the market, you'll be shocked. So he has become a professional in what he does. There's no life. 
The guy who is preaching behind the pulpit, composing himself, if you see him in the market, you'll be shocked. Is this the preacher? Everything he does here is packaging. He has mastered how to do what he's doing. So to him, it's a profession. It's no longer a flow of life. But when it is life, if you see him in the market, it will be the same thing. Paul was discipling people where he was making tents in the market. That's where he met Aquila. It was where he was making tents. He met them and they were talking the word. Paul was deliberating with people in the marketplaces. In Areopagos. Everywhere he went to, the thing was breaking out. So he was not a preacher in church. He was a preacher as a lifestyle. Because it was life breaking out of him. Everywhere he went to, he found himself talking Jesus. Talking Jesus. Jesus never preached on a pulpit. Jesus was preaching in the market. He was preaching where they were catching fish in the river. He was preaching in the desert. Everywhere he went, it was flowing. Because life is a flow. The call is unto life. And until you enter into life, you can never advance the kingdom. Look away from your activity for a while. People come to pray for four hours. And their goal is to beat four hours. And they do it for one year. Try to pray for four hours. What a waste of resources. When life comes, it is the hunger for the presence. So as you pray, you desire him. You discover that after you pray for a while, you are transported into the realm. The reason there is so much prayer and nothing is happening is because prayer is a profession. It's a goal. It's a target. Prayer is no longer a flow of life. That's why you pray every day for two hours. And then people are praying and looking at time. There's no appetite. The more you pray, the deeper you travel. Men are pray. It was told of men like Babalola that they could kneel down and pray for three days. They leave the realm where they were. They leave the realm. The prayer is supposed to carry you into the realm. But now we have short-circuited everything to activity. So we come for prayer meeting to pray for one hour, 30 minutes. And our goal is time. The goal is not time. We are called into life. So what? How do you maximize life? It begins with a consciousness and understanding that life is working in you. So you submit to the protocol of life. You need to submit to the protocol of life. Let me show you a few scriptures very quickly. Before we just start talking on and on. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 verse 20. The very preaching began with a communication of life. You know, I told you yesterday that when we come to preach and talk the word of God, we are not coming to bring something from heaven. We are coming to transmit life from our spirits to the person hearing. Jesus said, the words I speak, he said, they are spirit and they are life. They are spirit, they are life. Jesus was not talking to educate people. But if you listen to him, you'll be educated. But Jesus was talking to impart himself into you. His goal was not primarily to educate people. Our world now is a world full of rema. A young man who has not proven any revelation comes to discredit a father. What is he saying? It's wrong. This, 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 this. Full of head knowledge. That's why pride is everywhere. The goal is not to educate. The goal is to impart life. That life teaches you all things. In 1 John 2, 27 we say that anointing, it teaches you all things. But while you are being imparted with life, knowledge will come. But we focus not on knowledge, but on life. He said, the angel came. When the apostles were locked in prison, they were released from there. And he said to them, he said, go, stand and speak in the temple to the people. All the words of this life. You see, the understanding they have. When they come to minister the gospel, they come to communicate all the words of life that's why you couldn't listen to them and be the same you listen to them you become what they are in first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 paul said in as much as we have loved you we have not only communicated to you the gospel of jesus but we have imparted unto you the substance of our soul when they communicate the gospel they transmit life because until life begins to walk in you death will still keep you captive Stand in the temple and teach them all the wars of this life. It's not a calling on to rules and regulations. But when life begins to walk in you, you discover that you are abiding. You abide. That's why they say there is no law against law. When it walks, you are kept under the law. But when you look forward to the law, you will never fulfill it. 
Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 verse 18. He said, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then had God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. You need to have this understanding. It will change your orientation. It's a call unto life. We focus on rules and we forget the essence. On rules. And that's why secretly, most people, they are pure on the outward, but in the inward, they are dirty. Because they try to meet up. A man who flows naturally, he is what he is, anywhere, anytime. Life is no longer a charade. It's no longer an act. It's a flow. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, these ones were not Jews. The normal people, the Greek, who are drinking beer on the street, every kind of person, as they came and spoke to them, it was not theology. They just talked Jesus to them. And life entered them. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. So even your ordination is unto eternal life. The reason God called you, programmed you to come into the kingdom was an ordination unto eternal life. But you have not been operating by eternal life. Naturally, you know what to do. Your life educates you on what to do. Nobody tells you when to eat. When you are hungry, you know. Because that's the protocol of life. Even as a, a child who is just born, the moment that he or she is given birth to, he begins to cry. And then he begins to look for what to eat. Put the hand in the mouth, put things in the mouth until they, they, he's, he or she is fed. Who taught the child? Life has an educational system in itself. You must change your mind from activity-driven Christianity into life-giving Christianity. He said the first Adam was a living soul, but the second Adam was a life-giving spirit. The goal is impartation of life. And if you don't have that consciousness, you cannot operate in it because the proof of life is consciousness. When the consciousness is not there, you cannot operate it. When I understood this, I was delivered. So sometimes, immediately I come to pray, I'm teleported. Because I gained understanding. A point came where most of the revelations I have is when I'm flowing on the bike. As I'm on the bike, sometimes a song is singing, it's just flowing in my spirit. And then I connect to the song. Before you know, God begins to speak to me. On the bike, it separates you from the world. That's how life operates. Even when you are sleeping, that sequence is still there. Angels interact with you. I couldn't sleep through the night. I was receiving diverse kinds of revelations. I would just Your book and pen, of course, have to be by your side of your bed if you have come to a level where you talk to the Lord regularly. Because as He's speaking, you write. If you think you remember it, you have, you have, you have just robbed yourself. Because it didn't come from your mind. It's a disclosure. If you don't write it, it will vaporize. It didn't originate in your mind. Your mind was open and it was inserted. Say disclosure. So you keep writing. You keep writing. Sometimes you wake up, you discover you have written two pages. It's the word of this life. That's where it begins from. A lot don't understand it. So they wonder why they are praying and they are getting weary. But the Bible said in Isaiah chapter 40, from verse 30 31, he said, Even the young men shall fail, faint. And they shall utterly fall. He said, But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like the eagles. They shall walk, run, and not be weary. They shall walk, they shall not faint. How come you, you are waiting on the Lord and you are weary? It's because you are not drawing from the original foundation. You are waiting on the Lord according to rules and regulations. And your goal is to beat time. The man who goes to wait on the Lord because he wants to access his realm, that man draws from his presence. He said they go from strength to strength. Every one of them that appeared in Zion before the Lord. You make appearance because you are transported by the protocol of life. Christianity is a life. And until Christians begin to operate by life, the kingdom can never be manifested. It's not about rules. There are Buddhist monks that can do far better than you are doing. Some of them meditate for 16 hours every day. 
They have trained their will to that extent. They can meditate that long. But what's the difference? We have life. They don't have. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So you have to change your consciousness. And as you change it, then you account that this is working in you. That's how you begin to walk in it. In Romans chapter 6 verse 4, Paul writing, he said, Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. We also should what? Walk in the newness of life. In verse 11 he says, Account it therefore, account State it and tell yourself, acknowledge therefore that you also have been born into this life. Then you see that it begins to operate. It begins to operate. It begins to operate. And over time, it becomes a natural process in you. You know, the child, when he's hungry, just begins to cry, begins to cry. But as the child begins to grow, when he begins to sense hunger, he looks for what to what to eat. It's no longer cry. He has now mastered how he preach. And when you become an adult, you are hungry, you go and start cooking. It will like cry from morning to night. If you are not careful, your mother will knock you. You are 15 years old, a lady, and you are at home crying. What's wrong? I'm hungry. Are you okay? At that point, you should have mastered life. So a point comes where you feel the urge to pray. It's time to run away from your friends. That's the government speaking. There's a summon. There's a summon. And most times, if you respond like that, that's when you see visions. See, some people wonder why they never see things in the spirit. That's because when the gate is open, they are doing other things. An angel stands and is pulling you, pulling you, pulling you. And then that's when you are just here about mercy. Come up there. Mercy, Sabi, play ball, pass Ronaldo. Now you, they talk like this. When the angel departs, then you come. Oh, Father, I'm sorry. Baka, 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 baka. Pray for five hours. Nothing will shift. When the gate was open, you were not wise. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 19, verse 44, he said, There will be gnashing of teeth. He said, No stone shall be left unturned. And he said, There will be no deliverance for them. Why? He said, Because thou knowest not the times of thy visitation. There are kairos moments in the spirit. Things don't happen all the time. The chronological time is when you build up. As you come for fellowship every day, you are hearing the word of the Lord. You come for meetings, receive impartation, you are building up. So that when the Kairos time comes, you will have the energy to bring forth. But most people miss their Kairos times. Some have been coming for your fellowships consistently. But it is during this meeting that they decided to go somewhere. And maybe what came for them, they were not there on the appointment. It's a flow of life. That life will educate you. It will teach you, it will guide you, and it will control you. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, he said, For we that are in this tabernacle, we do groom, being burdened, not for that we, sh- we would be uncloded, but that we should be clothed upon and swallowed up by immortality. That was the burden of Paul. So when Paul prayed, it was not praying like you. You are praying so that you say, for five months now, I've been praying for three hours every day. I've been praying. So when you go to pray, I, I pray for three hours every day. No. When Paul is praying, he's praying that the weaknesses of this body should be swallowed up by another energy life. Another energy force. So when Paul needs to preach, he doesn't need motivation. When death comes, he doesn't move back. Fear no longer finds expression. Why? Because he has swallowed up mortality by immortality. That was his goal. He was going to Jerusalem. Seven persons came and prophesied and said, he shouldn't go, he'll be killed. He said, he's going to Jerusalem bound in the spirit. He met Agabus in the house of Luke. He came. Agabus was a renowned prophet. Carried his belt, tied himself. Said, the man that owned this belt. This is what will happen to him in Jerusalem. Paul still went ahead. He said, there's a witness in his spirit that God wants him to stand before the king. So everything that they were saying didn't move him again. Why? mortality have been swallowed up by immortality. So the purpose for his spiritual activity is different from your own. That's why you can pray the way he prays, but you will not have the same result. 
Because your orientation is wrong. Your goal is to pray for long. His goal is to find life. Because he knows it begins with life. The reason they are going for rural rugged, that day you feel like sleeping, is because life was insufficient. When life is sufficient, you'll be the first to move forward. Because that's the desire. You know when Peter called Jesus back and rebuked him, he said, get behind me, Satan. He said, for thou savoreth not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. When life is substituted, what the soul desires, they are pleasures. But when life is activated, spiritual things become your hunger. A point came when I was staying in my sister's place, children everywhere from morning to night television. So when, they, when Nepa sees light, I say, thank God. I'm happy because everywhere is quiet now. There was hunger for prayers. 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 So I celebrate when they take light. But the other guys were angry. Oh, see these people, oh, this movie, this movie. Thank God. Life was coming. A point now came, I discovered it was becoming difficult to pray. Ah, I knew there was crisis. That's why we take retreats. We take retreats for refreshing. Because we know we can't do it by ourselves. It's life walking in you. That thing you are doing now that you think you are a strong man, is a lie. It's life walking. You find yourself stand, pray for six hours. Life is walking. If life is consecutive, 30 minutes will be like 10 hours. So the old Christians knew, so they've gone for life. They stay in life. They confess life. They sit in it. Nobody is weak. All of us are just an expression of the measure of life that is at work in us. Nobody is weak. When life begins to flow, you'll be shocked. You that think 10 minutes prayer is long, you will pray for 10 hours and it will be like 5 minutes. You wonder what is happening. A point comes that as you do it consistently, then you begin to partner with the immortals. You will pray and then a realm will open and superimpose on your realm. Ah! That's when Christianity becomes fun. There was a day I was summoned by an angel. And as I knelt down to pray, light came out of the wall. I saw the light and it entered into me. I was there for, I thought it was 15 minutes. When I finished, it was 6 hours 45 minutes. I felt it was 15 minutes. This time around, another realm came and clothed my realm. So time was suspended. That was what happened to Moses. He went to the mountain for 40 days. He didn't know. Because when he was on the mountain... He was watching a movie of how God was creating the world. You could imagine how fascinated Moses was. He saw the Spirit of God moving upon the waters. Brooding upon the waters. There was darkness everywhere. And he heard God say, let there be light. Light appeared. You were the one thinking he was there for 40 days. Moses was being fascinated in a moment. In the spirit it was a moment. He was seeing all of those pictures and he was giving the laws the rules and the dimensions of the tabernacle. You think it's 40 days? <laughs> it is the walking of life. Some of you have shut down life for too long. That's why Christianity is so difficult for you. Without life, there can be Christianity. The, the faith began from the resurrection. Paul said, if there be no resurrection, then we are liars. You remain in your sin. He said, if only in this life there is hope, we are all men most miserable. First Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 12 to 22. He said, if Christ is not risen, then we are liars. Our gospel is vain. You are still in your sin. Your faith is vain. It began with life. If the foundation of your faith is not built on life, you have not started. You will struggle until when you go old, then you will be weak. The reason you are weak is because life is not operational. Ah, life is not operational. What we need is life. Reorient yourself. Tell yourself, I'm not doing this thing because it's a rule. I'm doing it because a new kind of life has been imparted into my spirit. And then you acknowledge it. You acknowledge it. In Philemon 1 6, he said, Let the communication of your faith become effectual. By the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you. It's until you acknowledge that is there, it can never manifest. You acknowledge that you have the life of God. You are full of the life of God. 
You walk by the life of God. You operate by the life of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul said, according as it is written, they believe and have spoken. He said, we, having the same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore we speak. We believe, therefore we speak. And because of that utterance, something was changed in his mind. And in verse 18, he said, why we look not at the things which are seen? Verse 17. But the things that are unseen. He said, for the things that are seen, they are temporal. But the things that are unseen, they are eternal. He had begun to see beyond his circumstances. You need to acknowledge it. When you go for a meeting, you say, life is working in me. I'm full of the life of God. When sin comes to shut you down, you say, no, the life I have is of God. When sickness comes, you said, I have the Zoe in me. That life cannot be sick. It cannot die. It's the endless life. Look at Hebrews chapter 7 verse 16. See what the Bible says. Quickly. Look at what the Bible says. He said, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment. He said, but after the power of an endless life. That's the life you have in you. He was speaking of Jesus. It is the power of an endless life. Christianity is a life given expression through humanity. It's the God life, the God life given expression through humanity. Focus on it when you pray, and you will break into the realm of God. Forget the time charade and rubbish we do in the church. They are praying, somebody is not praying at the back until he handles the mic, and then he wants to scatter the whole building. But when he was not on the mic, he was not praying. That's why you come to, to, to exercise your will. And you leave. You don't know why you become stronger in sin. What you are doing is that you are exercising your will. You are not exercising life. When somebody else is praying, you are, you are, you are meditating. But when they give you mic, rubbish. If you know what it is, even when you are at the back, you are staring up yourself. You are staring up yourself because he say, You dearly beloved, Jude 20, building up yourself upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So you don't wait to carry the mic. This, your power is the Holy Ghost. These are the workings of life. You don't know why we are weak. We are weak because we are wrongly oriented. We are supposed to be the greatest wonder the world sees. Let me show you the structure of the, of, of the, of the, of the human spirit. So that you understand what I'm telling you. I want to show you how the government regulates you. And how life is supplied to you. This is what the human spirit looks like. Okay. And this is what the soul looks like. This is what the inner man looks like. Your spirit is made up of your, your intuition, the communion, and the conscience. The soul overlaps from the conscience. Because the conscience is a monitoring valve for the spirit. Are you listening? Your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your intellect. If the cord of your emotion is stirred, you find under the anointing, there are different portions of the soul that are touched. If it touches your emotion, you find people overwhelmed, they are slain, some are crying and all of that. Through the word of God, if it is educated, this is where analysis takes place. Because in your mind, you have your thought pattern, your reasoning, you have your intellect, your memory. All of those patterns, they are restored by the word of God. Your will is where decision is made. That's why you see that most people are crying, but they can't decide for God. 
Decision is not made in the emotion. The will is the deepest part of the soul. The deepest part. And that's why it overlaps more with the conscience. When your will is affected, you begin to make decisions in the right direction. Listen now. Life flows from your spirit. Because your spirit is joined with the spirit of God. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, Him that hath the Son hath life. Because the life is what? In the Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son, God, Son of God, hath not life in him. Next verse. He said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. Because if you don't have this consciousness as a present hour consciousness, you will never operate by it. Are you seeing why it's very imperative? The life you have is in the Son. And the Son in you is the Holy Spirit. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, he said, Him that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So the supply of life comes from your spirit. And as it flows from your spirit, it enters into your soul. Now, I'll have you know also that because of the fall, the soul suffered three kinds of corruption. The three kinds of corruption affected three things. It affected the image. It affected the likeness. And it affected dominion. Man, according to Genesis 1.26, man was made in the image and likeness of God. And in verse 27, he said, they have dominion. Now, these three frequencies were supposed to function in the man, who in Genesis 2-7 became a living soul. But because of the fall, what happened is that the image was corrupted, the likeness was corrupted, and dominion was stolen. So, the man could no longer be a representation of God. He could no longer exercise the character of God. And he could no longer take authority over nature the way God ordained it. And Adam began to walk in. So the first time God declared that he had a son on earth was when Jesus appeared. Because Jesus had no corruption. So he said, behold, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. This guy did not have the corruption of the image, the corruption of the likeness, and he had full dominion. So Jesus could walk on water. He didn't need the sea to be parted. You need faith to part the Red Sea. But to walk on water means you have dominion over water. That's not faith. That's dominion. Are we together? Jesus could speak to a tree and the tree dies. That's dominion. So Jesus was the first representation of the full man. But every other man who suffered the fall, because of the loss of the eye, his image was corrupt. Because of the loss of the flesh, his likeness was corrupt. And because of the pride of life, his dominion was corrupt. Now, pride is simply an expression of somebody who doesn't have capacity to manifest. So he makes a show of what is not his. So that's why when you carry your father's car, you want everybody to see you. When you look good, you want everybody to see you. Because you are not always good. So that day that you made that new hair, you just, you sit down, you keep talking. You are drawing attention. Because you are not always like that. You have lost dominion. So you manifest it in a corrupt way as pride. The character of God can no longer be seen because of the loss of the flesh. So Jesus said the correction is for man not to dwell by, live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That thing now reconfigures the likeness. The word of God reconfigures here. So any man that feeds constantly on the word of God begins to receive energy to do the things of God. Because the strength comes from the world. Jesus said, okay, it's general. According to the law of the spirit, what you see, you become. In First John chapter 3, from verse 1 down, he said, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be like. He said, but when we shall see him, we shall be like him. Now, we see the world. We see the world. That's why we are like the world. Are you seeing that? And then dominion comes when you begin to walk in the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom, Matthew 6, 33, and all other things shall be added. So that's how this mutation is corrected. Do you see that? Now, the one that helps us correct this mutation. Okay, let me say something before I say that. When you see 
God in his presence, in his word. Your image is reconfigured. Right? Are we together? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. We all with unveiled faces beholding us in the glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. So the image is what? Corrected. When you feed on the word of God, the likeness is what? Corrected. Man shall not dwell, live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And when we seek the kingdom, we have what? Dominion. So what all of those things does is that it infuses life into our soul from our spirit. As we are looking at God, the spirit opens and life is imparted into the soul. The image is altered back. As you feed on the word of God, the spirit is open. Life is supplied and strength comes to do the things of God. As you seek the kingdom, this opens. But what controls and regulates the operation of these things is called the spirit. You know, I told you I was going to share two vital ingredients that helps us to come back into what? In God, right? And I said the first was life. I've shown you that everything you do, the raw material for doing it is what? Is life. And how life does it is that it is supplied to the soul. Because the soul is the realm of expression. You express yourself through your emotions and all of that, through your mind as you communicate, and then through your abilities. So life usually is supplied to the soul in order for us to manifest. But what governs the operation of life is the spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. What governs the operation of life is the spirit. This is where the key is. A lot of persons are not in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And they are disobedient to the laws of the Holy Ghost. You will never amount to anything in life. I've seen people who speak in tongues radically. And they are given to immorality. I've seen people who quote... 50 scriptures for 30 minutes message and they are dying in sin I've seen them because you may have everything in your soul but if the Holy Ghost does not carry you you will never enter into reality he said for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death it is the spirit that activates the Power of life to find expression in you. Without the spirit, even if you have life, you can never find expression. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 3 18, He said, We all with unveiled faces beholding as in a glass the image of the Lord. He said, We are changed. The word change is the word metamorphosis. He said, We are changed by the spirit, not by what we are seeing, by the spirit. He said, from glory to glory. It's the spirit that carries you into reality. So you must always subscribe to the government of the Holy Spirit in order to enter into your realm of reality. Good, you are beholding the word. Good, you are eating the word. And good, you are subscribing to the kingdom. But you may never amount to anything until you obey the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16 verse 13. How be it when the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truths. The way the Holy Ghost does it is through government. You already have the raw material. It's when you obey the government. That that thing begins to find expression. That's why you see that. Now you are not seeing. Thou shalt not speak. The Holy Ghost comes today and say. Fast. It's not in the Bible. That's government. That's the kingdom now walking through you. He said what? Fast. You want to eat, you lose your peace. Be wise. You may quote 100 scriptures. If you don't obey what he's saying, nothing will manifest through you. Fast. You subscribe. You want to go and watch football, say pray now. Pray now. I just came back from prayer meeting. Pray now. That's where the difference begins to happen. What he's doing is that he is churning off the corruption of your soul away. The lust of the eyes, he's taking it. Those are the things that corrupt your vistas. The lust of the flesh, he's taking it. The pride of life, he's taking it. And the only way he does it is that he narrows the path for you. So that those extravagant laxity that are expressive in you begins to fall off. It streamlines your vistas. It streamlines them. 
you are a preacher. You want to go on Facebook, then you are grieved. Facebook is not bad now. Yes, Facebook is not bad, but there's evil in Facebook. So today, the Holy Ghost doesn't want you to behold something. So you say, no, no Facebook. You, 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 you put it down. After 30 minutes, you carry again. You want to, you are grieved. Ah, be wise. No Facebook again until peace restores. That's how we enter. It is a government. So when we say the kingdom of God is the governing influence of a king, that's what we are talking about. He comes to seize your life from you. He said when Jesus was baptized, as he got up from the river, he said he was driven by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He was driven. The man was yielded. He submitted to government. And when Jesus returned, in Luke chapter 4 verse 14, he said, he returned in the power of the spirit. In the power. He entered the wilderness as a carpenter. But he returned as light. And immediately the Bible said that it might be fulfilled. That which was written by Isaiah the prophet. In the land of Zebulun. In the land of Naphtali. By the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. Behold, they that were in the shackles of death. Light is sprung forth. Why? He obeyed the spirit. He was driven into the wilderness. When he came, he came with power. The Bible said his fame spread abroad. You don't know why you are praying. You are quoting scripture, there is no power. Because there is no obedience. Obedience is the ingredient that supplies power to your soul. He returned in the power of the spirit. And he didn't stop there. Immediately his purpose opened. He went into the synagogue. Now the spirit had taken over. Matthew chapter 4 verse 16. He went into the synagogue as his custom was. And he was handed over the scroll of Isaiah. And he opened. And found where it was written. And found where it was written. And found where it was written. And then he began to give the declaration of his reality. He found where it was written. Luke 4 16. He found where it was written. Okay. And there was delivered unto him the book of prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Next. The spirit. You see what he said? The spirit. Without the spirit, he is a carpenter. Now that he has obeyed, he has returned with power. His fame had gone abroad. He had become the light of the world. And then he began to give his manifesto. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me. You see what? Jesus was the word. In John chapter 1 verse 1 he said, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. Jesus was the word. He was the fullness of life. But he could never manifest. Why? Because he had not been anointed by the spirit. In verse 12 he said, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the word it was analyzing was Jesus, the person. But he could never manifest. Why? The spirit was not upon him. The moment the spirit came upon him, the first thing that was established was government. The spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He returned with power, fame. And then he could now render his manifesto. He said, for the spirit of God is upon me. Luke chapter 4 verse 17. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He was the word. Everything he said was the word of God. But he could not release it with power. Now, whatever he spoke was light. Was life and spirit. The words I speak, they are what? Spirit and life. Why? Because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the broken heart. Now, the word has syllables of operation. Before, he was just the word of God moving. But now, 
gospel can reach the poor because the spirit power has come. Now broken hearts can be healed because the word has become an, a cure. Are you seeing what's happening? He to preach deliverance to the captives. Now the word can cast demons because the spirit has come. And recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. Guide you into all truth. Into all truths. Into all truths. The time for your transformation has come. I pray that the Lord will hear you because you will pray with a genuine heart this morning. If you pray honestly this morning, heaven will hear you. Because there is a confidence we have. The confidence we have is that whenever we pray according to his will, he heareth us. And if he heareth us, then we know that he will accomplish our petitions. Ask him for the grace to obey. For the grace to obey. Yours may be your dress code. I'm not talking about don't wear trousers as a law. No. I'm saying what's the Holy Ghost telling you when you dress? The clothes you wear. What is the government of, your, of the Holy Ghost charging you about? Will you obey today? Those moments when you are summoned to the Spirit to pray, will you now begin to go there and ask for grace? Those moments when you talk too much, you talk too much and you say, quiet now. Quiet. You want to explain the whole world, you say, quiet now. Shut down. The thing is not about talking. He's bringing your soul to alignment. The thing is not about dressing. He's bringing your soul to alignment. So that through you, heaven can be the road. Your soul is traveling. It's floating here and there because of the corruption it suffered on account of the fall. The Holy Ghost wants to gather you back. Because there is a, 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 a lifestyle that he wants you to manifest. There is a life force he wants you to release. And until your soul is fine-tuned, it's like the converging lens. You set it until it comes to a point where it can transmit that light to its spot. Then it can illuminate it. It can burn because it has been gathered. Your soul needs to be gathered. Will you obey the Holy Ghost? It's a call unto repentance. It's a call unto the glory realm. Today we have 9 million people gathering in a camp. But our world is not changed. In the days of the apostle, 120 people gather in the spot. And as they left, they changed their world. The Bible said the company of the priests became obedient to the faith. He said, this be the men that turned their walls upside down. They were 120 men. We have millions in camps today, nothing happens. Because there is no heart alignment. There is no obedience. Many are quoting scriptures here and there. But there is no transmittance of life. It is through obedience that we enter into the realities of power. Our world needs to change. And every one of us have been numbered. I told you last night that there is an army coming. It is an army that will not break their ranks. It is an army that understands the legal system of the kingdom. And it is because of that that when they fall upon... And so for you to manifest, you have to build up, build up in prayer. Because there is a place you pray to where there are coals of fire. That's where your tongue will be touched. And if your tongue is touched, it will be purged. When you come back, you can become a prophet.